Hey, it's Andrew here at BTO Range in Conroe, Texas again. And today on the tabletop, we have a Savage uh, Model 94, uh, specifically a 94F as in Foxtrot. So a uh, 12-gauge single-shot shotgun. And uh, kind of the, the more interesting thing about this little gun is the 36-inch barrel that's on this gun. So... Um, and we'll talk about what barrel length do and, and what's good and what's bad about them here in just a bit. But a little about the shotgun itself. Um, Stevens arms originated way back uh, around 1864 in Chicopee, Massachusetts. And uh, they were producing shotguns and rifles and target pistols. And, and they, uh, they, in fact invented and brought out the 22 long rifle cartridge Stevens Arms Company did. And then um, in 1902, uh, they were actually billing themselves as the largest producer of sporting arms in the world, uh, just with their variety of products that were being offered and the sheer volume that they were putting out. And then uh, 1915, May of 1915, uh, Stevens was acquired after a pretty tumultuous process. Stevens was acquired by New England Westinghouse specifically to produce war materials uh, for Russia in World War I. They were producing the Mosin and Gant rifles. And the whole big drawn out story about that, the 1917, the, the uh, Bolsheviks in Russia uh, took over from the Tsar, from the Tsar and then the contract went away and Westinghouse didn't get paid and there was all kinds of solvency issues. And in uh, April of 1920, Stevens ends up being uh, acquired by Savage, who was Savage Arms, which was in the process of uh, acquiring other things. They acquired Fox, they acquired uh, a few other names. They ended up with the Crescent shotgun brand, the Crescent Davis and, and uh, Balsam Arms and all that stuff, along about the same time. So they were they were acquiring all these different brands about the time about that time, and Stevens was one of them. And and uh, Stevens remained <clears throat> a brand name of Savage um, through at least 1942, uh, and then Stevens is still used. The Stevens name is still used by Savage today on some of their. Um, Entry level, if you will, bolt action guns like the Stevens 200, and then there's a there's a, some Stevens name usage on some imported over and under shotguns. So, in uh, in 1960, well, in 1942, there was still the plant uh, in Chicopee Falls uh, was closed, and they they brought they brought uh, production. There was some production in Utica, New York, but in 1960. Savage in in an entirety moved to Westfield, Massachusetts. So, and the and the whole reason for bringing all this up and it gets complicated, gets convoluted as to where they were and when, is that a lot of these guns were not serialized, so there's no serial number charts. So, uh, you have to uh, you can base an approximation on when a gun was made by how it is marked and. Uh, so this gun, this particular gun, uh, is marked, and let's let's clear it, and then we'll turn it around. So top lever, open here with an ejector. So on this side, 36-inch barrel, i got to make sure I don't remove ceiling tiles here. So on this side of the receiver, we see the uh, Stevens Model 94F and then Savage Arms underneath it, but we see the Westfield... Uh, Massachusetts USA marking here on the side of the receiver so that indicates manufacture post 1960 and we see that it does not have a serial number marked on the receiver so that gives us between 1960 and 1968 or at least October of 1968 is when the Gun Control Act of 68 mandated that all, all these guns become serialized at that point. So let's go ahead and close it so we can prop it back up. So if you if you look closely here, this thing is almost as long as the table. So I've taken some chalk and I've highlighted two marks, one on the side of the barrel and one on the side of the receiver. Savage used date codes 
on guns produced from 1949 through 1968. And you'll find those in an oval somewhere on the exterior of typically the frame of the receiver of most uh, Savage slash Stevens uh, slash Springfield, uh, which was another brand name used by Savage. Not Springfield Armory, completely a different thing, but uh, it's somewhere going to be on that receiver. So on this particular gun, we find it on the on the barrel and then again on the receiver. And I've highlighted that with, with chalk because it can be hard to see. So it's typically an oval about the size of a pencil eraser. That'll have a number and a letter, and the number is meaningless. It, it was probably a specific inspector code for that attributed to a particular person. The letter is a date code, and those charts are there. I think it began with the letter uh, A in 1949 and then proceeded um, through 1968 uh, without using O and Q. So um, this one is a V, and we had to look... Uh, very carefully with magnifying uh, lenses and, and light at an angle because sometimes they're not very poorly struck, they're not very well struck, uh, which would correspond to 1968 uh, for this particular shotgun. So, sometime made uh, before or immediately before serialization was required under the Gun Control Act. So, um, and that's just good information to have. It, it really doesn't affect any legality of anything. And, and that's something that we hear a lot at the range. My gun doesn't have a serial number. And there is a big difference between a serial number that's been altered and removed or a gun that never had a serial number to begin with. Prior to the effective date of the Gun Control Act of 68, <coughs> domestically produced shotguns and 22 rimfire rifles were not required to be serialized in the United States. Imports always were. Handguns always were. They, they have serial numbers. Uh, but guns like this, or 22 rifle from Stevens, would not necessarily be serialized if it was made before 68. And that's true of a lot of different manufacturers, Remington, Winchester. A, a lot of them had non-serialized models. Uh, now, they could serialize them, and, and some models were serialized from the beginning in all of those manufacturers, and some were not, depending on what the, I don't want to say what the price point was, that doesn't seem to make a difference, but it, it would be what the target audience was, if you will. So uh, the more upscale, I guess, uh, placing in the catalog, the more liable they are to be uh, serialized. That said, Crescent Arms, manufacturer of, of hundreds and thousands and you know over a million uh, single and and side-by-side uh, -side shotguns for production and hardware store catalogs. They were all serialized. So uh, some were, some weren't. If the gun uh, is prior to 1968 and doesn't have a serial number and there's no evidence of a serial number being removed, then the gun is perfectly fine. Regardless of when a gun was manufactured, if the serial number has evidence of being altered or removed, then that's a problem. So that's that's uh, the easiest way to look at that. So because Grandpa's old shotgun or Grandpa's old 22 doesn't have a serial number marked on it, is is not necessarily a cause for concern unless there's evidence that it's been altered or removed. So anyway. Back to this little shotgun. So 36 inch barrel. Um, we saw that a lot. I remember when I was a kid growing up, uh, the old timers back then, I guess I'm an old timer now, but the old timers back then all said, man, you got to have that long barrel because it makes it shoot harder. And that was, that was a term that I heard growing up. Uh, from all these old guys, regardless of whether we we're talking about rifle or handgun rounds or shotgun shells or, or whatever, the gun shot harder. Uh, meaning to imply that somehow this 36 inch barrel made the gun not necessarily shoot farther, not necessarily more accurate. That wasn't what they were referring to. They just believed that it made them hit better and have uh, better results on whatever they were shooting because they had the longer barrel. And, and a lot of that, 
I'm positive it's just because of personal belief and, and the lore just kind of spread. Uh, having said that, now with the, with the uh, modernization of shotgun shells with plastic wads versus cardboard wads and, and the, uh, the technological advances in nitrocellulose and smokeless powder and, and buffered shot and, and all of these other things, a 36 inch barrel absolutely has no effect on the actual ballistics of the shotgun shell. It does not increase velocity. In fact, it may hinder velocity uh, when you compare it to the same gun with say a 28 or even 26 inch barrel. So uh, remember that a shotgun shell, um, about 12,000 PSI, uh, as opposed to 50,000, 55,000 on a centerfire rifle. So. Uh, we're actually gaining all the velocity we're going to gain in about 20 inches, uh, 22 inches maybe, on a shotgun shell. And uh, anything else, you know, friction takes effect. So uh, so what's the advantage of a 36-inch barrel? The, and a lot of it is personal preference. You know, very tall people with longer arms tend to swing a longer shotgun better. Uh, and a lot of people go with those longer barrels now, even in the competitive shotgun game, uh, take, take, for example, typical American skeet used to be a skeet gun. Any skeet gun designed from the factory as a skeet gun came out with a 26-inch barrel. But now we routinely see top competitors uh, in skeet and three-gun, uh, not three-gun, but um, sporting clays. We typically see those people shooting 30 and 32-inch barrel guns uh, in these uh in these games that require swinging through a flying target. And that's where I think personally, at least for me, I prefer the longer barrel, 28 or 30 inch barrels, is because it helps me that additional weight out front, the inertia of the swing helps me not stop my follow through <clears throat> and shoot behind the target. So remember, uh, when you fire a shotgun shell, it's not a single projectile, it's a string of shot coming out of the barrel. And as you're moving laterally with that barrel, that spreads out in, in, in a string of, of uh, shots. So uh, the idea is to keep that smooth and, and stay ahead of your flying target and not stop your swing and end up shooting behind uh, the, the clay or the bird or whatever you're shooting at. So anyway, that's in my opinion for what that's worth. Uh, the longer barrel, for me, helps uh, helps me make sure that I don't swing through. Would I shoot a 36 inch barrel? Not necessarily so. Um, that said, some people love them. Some people um, argue that they get a tighter constriction and a better pattern from the longer barrel. I would say that if you set up a 28 or a 26 inch barrel with long forcing cones overbore with uh, the correct choke, then you'll have as good a pattern as you'll get out of a 32. But a lot of it's personal preference and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So let's talk about what these guns are worth. There's a bunch of them. This is a Stevens 94F Frank. They started making these guns in the late 20s, the Model 94 series, and they produced them on into the 80s. And there's a bunch of different variations. There's 94, 94A, all the way through 94F, and then there's 94Cs, where uh, a lot of those were made for Sears and Wards and, and everyone else uh, under different brand names. And then there's various sub-models, 94C Series H, and all of these are gonna differ by uh, some characteristic, whether the trigger guard is configured differently, whether it's walnut versus hardwood stocks, whether uh, the, the top lever may be different. There may be some minor difference that caused Savage to create a different sub-variant of the Model 94. And that can be somewhat frustrating when you get one of these guns in uh, with a problem because you wanna try to make the parts up correctly. The good news is that most of the parts interchange, except for those parts that are a specific variation for that particular sub-model. And you have to start looking at uh, the old catalogs, uh, fortunately, uh, places like Jack First Inc. and Gun Parts Corp. Uh, put out both print volumes that have schematics 
of the different submodels and you can compare the parts in them. Uh, some of that stuff's available online. Uh, and a lot of the good news is a lot of the parts are being remade, the firing pins are being remade, things of that nature. So uh, what typically goes wrong with these guns? Not a bunch. Uh, other than the, the abuse, it's not the gun's fault. If someone, I, I've had these guns come in with the stock broken here because grandpa swung it at a tree trying to hit a raccoon or a squirrel or something and broke the stock, but that, that's not the gun's fault. But the firing pins do break. So uh, if you're going to evaluate one of these, you're going to buy it as a shooter. What, what I suggest doing, and you can do it right there at the counter of the shop, open it up, leave the gun open. All you have to do is pull the with the hammer down, pull the, uh, the trigger to the rear, push the hammer forward, and you should see that firing pin extend through the breech face, and it'd probably be easier to do it with it open. So let's go ahead and, that just pulls off. This spring right here fits into this notch in the, in the barrel lug. Then we can just open this and rotate it out and off. Now, there may be gun shops out there that don't want you to take their gun apart uh, to this degree. And, you know, it's their gun and their business, so uh, respect that decision. If, uh, and then you make the decision as to whether you want to buy it or not, if you can't inspect it further. But uh, just hold the trigger to the rear, push the hammer forward, and you should see that firing pin come through. Now, there is no firing pin retraction. The firing pin retraction is done by recoil. But the hammer, there on this particular variant, there's uh, a camming surface that re makes the hammer rebound. So the firing pin is held in place by a set screw through the top of the receiver right here. So if this firing pin were to, and they do break if, if the crud and grit or whatever cause the firing pin to stick in the forward position and somebody forces that barrel open, it can break the tip of the firing pin. So if that's the case, all you would have to do is you can pull the hammer back, remove this, this screw uh, out of the top, and then the firing pin will just come out this way and you replace it with a new firing pin that way, uh, back in from, from the rear forward and then put the set screw back in. It's literally a five minute process, not difficult at all. So uh, pulling this stock, there is a through bolt here. Um, you would pull the butt plate off, take the stock bolt off, stock comes off. And uh, there's a really significant hammer spring under there. There's a spring that, powers uh, the top lever. And, and really, it, it's fairly simple. The top lever, the locking system of this gun, let's see if we can do it this way. When I, when I operate the top lever, there's a locking block right down here. When I operate the top lever, you see that the locking block kind of retract. And that's locking in. When the gun is locked, it's locking into this surface right here. So uh, if the gun is starting to pop open uh, when it is shot, then we typically have either a spring issue, uh, spring needs to be replaced, or uh, there's something wrong with this mating surface between the two. This is a simple ejector. There's a heavy spring under here pinned in place, um, and, and that's easily replaced as well. So the ejectors are available. Um, and they're available remade. Uh, they, they may require fitting as to width, and they may require fitting to this surface right here. So that's, that's a little time consuming, but it's not necessarily difficult to make the gun function again. If the forend is popping off or coming loose in your hand when you shoot, it's typically because we're not, we're not uh, locked into here. This is, this is a, uh, a spring in and of itself. It's, it's a tension, it's uh, tempered is what I'm trying to say. This edge fits into this notch right here. And compressing it compresses this and holds it in place. So should, the, should this be popping off when you, when you shoot it, it's a simple matter to pull the forend iron off, screw here, screw here, separate the wood from the metal, replace this spring, and then there's a small leaf spring underneath it that keeps it popped up. Um, the only thing the small spring underneath it does is make it easier to position this to lock into here. It doesn't really have much effect other than that. So 
Uh, that said, you would always want to check the check the shotgun for bulges and dents in the barrel, especially one with a 36 inch barrel. Pretty heavy barrel, but it could still it could still happen. Uh, can it be shortened and choke tubed installed? 100%. We could absolutely install a choke tube in it. But uh, doing that is m way more than um, than what the gun's value is. So, which brings up that question. So the same things we always look at: the originality, condition, and the scarcity. So, scarcity of this gun, not at all. Uh, millions of the 94 series were made in various configurations. Some are more collectible than others. You get down into um, guns chambered for 44 xl shot or uh, guns marked as 36 gauge or things of that nature would tend to bring more certainly and uh, there are some rarer variants the 36 inch barrel three inch magnum gun i believe it's a three inch magnum gun it should be three inch chamber so uh, some of these the early ones are two and three quarter this is a three inch chambered gun in uh, 36 inch barrel so it'll be a full choke a little bit more uncommon than the 28 or 30 inch guns for sure so there may be a little bit of extra value there but not much typically these stevens single shot guns are 75 to 100 dollar shotgun uh, all day long they're still being used uh, there's no reason not to they're still being used uh, out in the woods and the farms and, and wherever people are hunting squirrels and rabbits and whatever else you'd hunt with a 12-gauge shotgun, uh, I'm sure there are people doing it with a variant of the Stevens 94. So uh, scarcity, not so much. Uh, originality, we're, uh, this is press checker. Remember, 1968, they just, just about everything had impressed checkering in it in 68. This is no different. Um, it's not been reblued. It's still got the fake uh, cyanide-based uh, coloration to the receiver that we see on other Savage guns of the same period. So the wood, we believe, yeah, the wood is is still, uh, and this is the original wood with the impressed checkering pattern. This is not walnut. It's a, an American hardwood, probably ash or birch uh, with a walnut stain. We've got a bit of a divot out of it right here. Uh, we could stain that brown again just to make it look better. But um, overall, okay condition. Doesn't have a ton of rust on it. This is the worst part of it is this little piece right here. That's the worst of it. So, and still a very functional, usable shotgun. So I think it's 100 to 100 and a quarter all day long. It might even go for a little bit more than that, maybe up to about 100 and a half, maybe up to 150 bucks. Uh, just someone that absolutely wants a 36-inch barrel shotgun for whatever reason. So uh, they don't. There's not a ton of money. It's still a good utilitarian field shotgun. Not a super collectible item. Uh, that said, what people collect uh, doesn't all have to be just Winchesters and, and uh, Colts, right? So uh, there's no reason not to. And there's plenty of a diversity there if you wanted to try to capture all the different models of it going back into the 20s, back before Savage even had Stevens. Uh, the receivers looked different, and they weren't really Stevens 94s at that point, but Stevens did have uh, single-shot shotguns before the 94. So anyway, I thought it was an interesting little gun. I get to talk about uh, what that 36-inch uh, barrel does and doesn't do, I guess. If you like what we're doing, hit that like button. Let us know. Hit that uh, subscribe button. We try to push out content uh, at least every week. Uh, and uh, hit that notification bell. So we're doing some new product reviews on the channel. We're doing uh, some take-apart videos and, and things of that nature as well. So we have a um, we have a companion company called Big Tech's Ordnance that has a pretty robust YouTube channel as well with a ton of podcasts and more high-speed, low-drag stuff on that channel than what we do here. So uh, if that's your thing, you might want to give that a shot. So as always, thanks for watching. We appreciate you, and we'll see you on the next one.